Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Extract. homelessness, racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private property, capitalism. capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In this episode, I will explore the pressing condition of housing real estate markets around the globe, as I'll try to predict some of the dystopian and utopian scenarios to come. According to the US Bureau of Economic Analysis, last year suffered the biggest economic decline since the demobilization from World War II in 1946. Overall, the U.S. economy contracted by 3.5% in 2020, that is in contrast from a year earlier, where there were expansions of about 2.2% in 2019, 3% in 2018, and 2.3% in 2017. Put in mind that also uh, at the end of last month, there have been a series of researches that were conducted by the Institute of Policy Analysis. And this was on behalf of another organization called the Patriotic Millionaires and Millionaires for Humanity. That is right, that organization exists. In this report, they put together data for different sources. And um, they demonstrated that the wealth of the planet's billionaires uh, jumped 54%. And this was, again, amid the global pandemic, right? Uh, which in most cases we seem to direct into a global economic collapse. In this report, they mentioned that the combined wealth of uh, billionaires um, rose from 8.04 trillion to 12.39 trillion. And this was between the period from March 18, 2020 and March 18, 2021. Now, this report also mentions that at the global level, uh, the wealthiest 20 billionaires um, have currently a combined $1.83 trillion in wealth. This was um, because of an increase of $734 billion, or 68% of their wealth, just in 2020. Again, this is during the year of the pandemic. Now, I want to put this in comparison. We're talking about a $1.83 trillion in wealth. Um, and the GDP of Spain in 2019 was 1.3 trillion. So you're talking that the combined uh, wealth of these 20 billionaires is now far exceeded the complete GDP of a country like Spain. Now, I want to continue contrasting, you know, what has been going on over the years and the different directions that the pandemic has taken in different kinds of population. So, for example, in the UK, um, one in five young people, uh, that means people that are between 18 and 34 years of age, um, have been exceedingly um, getting more worried about becoming homeless as a result of the pandemic. The UK Statistics Bureau uh, said that the coronavirus uh, left around 6 million people living in the fear of homelessness. Just last month, 21% uh, of uh, people that of the age between 80 to 34 years old had been borrowing money to pay either their rent or their mortgage. And this is uh, the UK Office for National Statistics. And they uh, basically have agreed in the reports that uh, most people under 25 have been the ones that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. And this uh, demonstrates by being occupying the space of three-fifths of the UK's unemployed population. 
bear in mind that during this period where I'm talking about, the house prices in the UK also have been rising strongly. Uh, the average house price in the UK over 2020 increased uh, approximately 6.4%, right? And uh, in these uh, nationwide house price indices, which is uh, the, the organization that did this research, saw uh, tremendous improvement of the housing prices. I mean, take into account that in 2019, they only had risen 0.8% compared to what they rose um, in 2020, which is 6.4%. Um, these uh, nationwide house price indices also said that this was the country's uh, strongest performance since 2014. Overall, you're seeing a uh, tremendous contradiction happening. And this is one of the things that I want to emphasize in the podcast of today. So let me uh, illustrate another sort of contradiction more in the Americas. It has been said that across New York, uh, as many as 1.2 million renters are at risk of eviction. And this was a national report on the National Council of State Housing Agencies. Uh, in the United States, the eviction moratorium, which has been put in place in the recent one by the Center for Disease Control, expires on June 30th. But however, you know, many of the renters that are right now being protected by this moratorium have found themselves entrapped in uh, mountains of debt, you know, uh, and accumulating debt over the time. And obviously, they've been struggling with, you know, a psychological toll um, and um, an economic toll, uh, which is uh, of high pressure. In this uh, analysis by the Association of the Neighborhoods of Housing Development, uh, we also have seen that landlords have beginning to file eviction cases 3.6 times faster in zip codes with the highest COVID-19 death rates, which obviously are normally where residents are primarily people of color uh, or uh, underrepresented communities. Again, contrasting this, the home price index in the United States argues that the property prices over the year of the pandemic rose 8.89%. And this is with inflation adjusted. See the contrast. 2018, uh, the property prices had just risen 1.37%. And in 2020, we suddenly have a rise of 8.89%. This is actually seen as the biggest year-over-year -year increase or growth ever recorded. And this was, again, during the pandemic. I'll say it again, too. This is while the U.S. economy contracted by 3.5%. Economy somehow contracting, but real estate prices continue on the rise and the demand continues on the rise. As this trend, you know, that I'm explaining, these sort of contradictions happen, you have capitalist organizations uh, uh, such as the World Bank that have uh, put up a statement on urban development that reads as follows. And I'm going to quote this statement specifically. They say, besides its impact on public health, the COVID-19 pandemic is generating a multifaceted and likely prolonged economic impacts, ranging from a disrupted global supply chains to bankrupt small businesses, with significant job losses and impacts on livelihoods of people everywhere, and especially in formal sectors, workers on those with irregular earnings and unstable jobs that have fewer safety nets to weather the crisis. Again, this is World Bank uh, statement on urban development during the COVID-19 pandemic. This happens at the very same time that Rolls-Royce motor cars had its best selling quarter in all its history. You know, this company has existed for 116 years. They um, broke all sales records, um, and as you know, the wealthy people snapped you know three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar cars, and this company that is owned by BMW just delivered one thousand three hundred eighty cars in the first quarter of two thousand twenty. That rose sixty two percent from the previous year in two thousand nineteen. The sale of ultra luxury vehicles 
went up during the pandemic 62%. Again, this was an absolute record. Continuing to discuss North America's housing market, we can also talk about Canada, you know, where the luxury sec sector of uh, housing prices or housing sales have been no exception in the way they've been going up. And uh, companies such as Sotheby's um, have uh, also put out reports, right, where they argue that the sales of homes uh, worth more than four million uh, Canadian dollars had climbed uh, over 150 percent in the Toronto area over the first months of 2021. So this is a very recent report. And at the same time, you see that the data from Toronto Regional Real Estate Board saw also sales increase uh, around 52% in general. Uh, moving to Europe, uh, this trend has also been mimicked in France. There's been a very sharp decline in property sales valued uh, below 3 million euros. But uh, obviously, the market for assets at prices in excess of 3 million euros has been on the rise. Uh, the CEO of uh, Daniel Fu, Conseil Immobilier, uh, which is a dominant uh, luxury French real estate agency, uh, said the following. So in the 3 plus million euro segment, our agencies in Paris achieve a sale every three days in 2020. The average sale price going for uh, was around 5 million euros. These sales were concluded at an average price per square meter of uh, close to 20,000 euros per square meter uh, compared to 70,000 euros per square meter in 2019. So this whole luxury real estate market represented a 9.2 increase in value. The same CEO noted the following. He said, uh, this trend demonstrates a persistent appetite uh, for real estate assets that are considered a safe haven. So you're talking about real estate assets that are considered a safe haven, especially in the current context where investments in, for example, bonds or life insurances seem less favorable. So if the CEO of this luxury French real estate firm is arguing that the safest place to put right now your money is in real estate. That appetite for a safe haven coincides actually with the findings of you know, another study of the US Federal Reserve, which uh, concluded that uh, the richest 1% of households uh, saw their net worth rise by some $4 trillion in 2020. Adding to these, in 2020, the US had created 56 new billionaires. Now, the key question that I want to pose is where will those $4 trillion that the US generated or the $12.4 trillion that the global economy generated go? Well, a big part of this money will be absorbed by cities, mostly in the form of real estate. The luxury real estate market has not slowed down on the opposite it has increased the marxist geographer david harvey which we had as a guest on the last episode has been one of the pioneers on trying to figure out how capital manifests itself in territory in space since the 1970s he has been arguing that Urbanization is one of the biggest absorbers of capital. High-rise towers appear everywhere, uh, luxury condos, luxury offices, uh, resorts, and all kinds of uh, luxury-driven uh, development. But this was in a period where there was a certain economic expansion. Obviously, we take into account, you know, the many crises that capitalism had produced uh, since the 1970s, including, of course, the 2008 financial crisis, which was in itself uh, originated by real estate markets. The property market seemed to have recovered very fastly after that. And when I talk about the property market or the real estate market, uh, bear in mind that I'm not talking about the market in which the majority of the population looking for a home 
to own and to use as a home. Most of urban dwellers don't share the ambition of highly speculative sort of scenarios where uh, your attempt is to flip properties or to commercialize with properties or to see properties as a commodity. Most of us urban dwellers see our property as what Marx would call a use value. We like our homes because you know, this is where we live our most of our daily lives, especially our daily lives during the pandemic have occurred mostly inside our homes. The condition of a use value uh, becomes much more important during these periods for the great amount of population than its exchange value. On the other hand, you have the not so common urban dweller, uh, which might actually not live in the city that they're buying property on, but that they belong to a class of people that see property as an investment and uh, they actually use property to speculate upon, but most importantly use property in order to absorb the great amount of uh, capital and profit they've made. What is very particular about 2020 is that on one hand, we saw the rise of urban poverty, you know, the same thing that the World Bank quote that I had just mentioned before. Uh, urban poverty is everywhere. I think uh, every single one of us that go into the city could see that happen. We see more homeless people, more needed people, uh, more mobilization on types of solidarity economies, the loss of jobs, uh, loss of livelihoods. But we see also a tremendous amount of money being generated during this period, which implies, of course, that those people, the capitalists that are going to be seeing properties as investment, right, as speculative uh, objects, are going to be buying and uh, trying to hoard their money or to put their money into these properties. And I don't think uh, in modern times we've seen such a dramatic distance between, on one hand, the economic viability of the majority of the population going down and the economic viability of the 1% going up so dramatically. And how this has inserted itself into the way our current urban spaces are produced. I always like to say that the city is the perfect mirror of capitalism. Capitalism today uh, is showing a much more dramatic face than it did before the pandemic. Overall, real house prices, which is, you know, that means that the prices uh, of houses adjusted inflation, have risen in 40 out of 53 uh, world's markets, uh, which are the ones that mostly publish statistics on this case. New Zealand raising uh, almost 17% of the prices. Sri Lanka almost 16 percent. Puerto Rico, which as many of us know, is, uh, has gone into you know, a dramatic poverty crisis uh, over the last years right? Uh, due to natural disasters, but also lack of resources that come from the United States, specifically at the period of uh, Trump administration. Uh, well, in Puerto Rico, the housing prices have gone up almost 15 percent. In Turkey, almost 14 percent. In the Slovak Republic, a little bit above 14%. These are dramatic figures for property to be on the rise at times of the pandemic. This Slovak Republic, 14.28% uh, rise, is while the economy of the country contracted almost 6%. So you have again the situation, the economy of the country contracting, but their housing markets expanding. The first dramatic trend that I see happening is the rise of uh, international real estate firms dedicated to buy out houses or property of those that cannot stay in that property anymore, whether it's through evictions and rentals or whether it's um, so that they cannot pay their mortgage and the banks also evict them. Uh, these are companies that are shaped to the trend of the famous Blackstone Group, which increased its portfolio of assets uh, during the 2008 financial crisis, uh, taking advantage of all the foreclosures, buying undervalued properties around the world. So if we read this well, there will be a lot of foreclosures and a lot of evictions going on. Many of these companies are already set up 
to purchase most of the stock that is going to be uh, left there. So bulk condo buyers are coming to your city very soon. All of them are looking for great deals, taking advantage of what uh, the Wall Street Journal said, pulverized condominium market, that it's opening the door for investors willing to buy individual apartments wholesale. Now, these are hedge fund managers, uh, other kinds of real estate firms, and again, new companies that are being shaped, cut from the same cloth as uh, Blackstone. And uh, they are at the moment uh, picking up uh, condominiums around the main metropolitan areas of the world at a rate of 100 plus condominiums, condominiums at a time. Even the Wall Street Journal says that these bulk buyers are like condo, Costco shoppers for condos. For those of you that are not in the United States, Costco would be like the main warehouse, the store where you buy uh, bulk items uh, for the cheaps or with lesser prices. And real estate brokers are at the moment negotiating and looking for these kind of buyers. Let me connect to previous week's podcast where we're talking about urban vacancies. Uh, one of the arguments that we put forward is that after the pandemic, there was going to be a dramatic rise of vacancies, or they're going to be continuing uh, pretty much as the vacancies that happen today, uh, whether it's in the office space or in the housing space. This enormous sort of purchasing power of real estate and luxury housing somehow contradicts that idea, right? I mean, in a sense that we're saying like everybody's, like all the rich people are buying homes, uh, that in a normal setting, we would think, well, you know, at some point they want to sell them, or at some point they're thinking of renting them. But what happens if that is not the case? What happens if the purchasing of all of these property it's going to remain empty. First of all, do we think that, that it's even possible economically? Most importantly, property in urban areas is meant to be used by someone. In theory, if you own a house and nobody wants to live in it, uh, then that house should uh, lose its value. But what is very strange about today's situation is that in luxury real estate, it's not losing value. On the opposite, it is empty. It will be empty. Investors are sort of trying to flock around buying hundreds and thousands of them. But I don't think they believe that they could fill them at any point, simply because most of the people that could afford the houses that they're purchasing, you know, the middle class or the lower middle class, right, in a sense for um, using it for its use value, have been decimated economically by the pandemic. What is going on here? Well, in my view, it's nothing more than the ultimate consequence of uh, neoliberal uh, policies in the city or neoliberal urbanization. The moment where all the housing projects and units and all the material artifacts of the city become pure commodities. If real estate's purpose has become solely to warehouse the wealth of those that are making more and more, then its dwelling purpose, its use value uh, for people to live in them uh, becomes secondary or tertiary. Real estate has slowly turned more and more into just the bearer of capital without taking into account its use. We're talking about the exacerbation of the exchange value of property and the consequences of its warehousing for the future of cities. So imagine this, an urban future where vacancies will continue where emptiness is no longer seen as a detriment for adding value to the commodity of real estate, where most of its population won't be able to afford it, and where its trading will only happen at the hands 
of multinational real estate investment firms or the very rich population that we tend to refer to as the 1%. The majority of the population dispossessed of what I think it's a basic human right. In this case, we're talking about housing and the minority concentrated housing, but not for the purpose of using it as a dwelling, but just to store their wealth. This is indeed a dystopian scenario that if things continue the way they are, wouldn't be so far-fetched to see happen in the coming decades. The pandemic without doubt has done nothing but accelerate the concentration of wealth of those at the top and decrease the wealth of those at the bottom. What would be the direction forward? What would be the utopian scenarios to address face-to-face -face these issues? What are the urgent things that we must do as citizens and as professionals, as parents, as lovers, as just regular urban dwellers to go against this trend. Well, many government dependencies, uh, some nonprofit organizations, some academic institutions, some researchers, writers, they would suggest that some of the uh, policies that are necessary uh, have to do with uh, taxes, you know, with fiscal incentives, with shifting sort of fiscal areas. Uh, in the case of the city I live in, New York City, I mean, we, we all know that uh, fiscal incentives for tax abatements for developers for real estate properties are incredibly high. Right. You have tax abatements, sometimes close to 30 years. Um, developers uh, profit almost immediately. And then the state covers a lot of the expenses. And uh, tune of the song is that the developers uh, earn the profits and the city somehow manages to get all the debt. So uh, fiscal incentives are certainly one way that can tackle this. You're talking about taxing the speculators. Um, uh, dramatic examples of these uh, are types of taxes where uh, if you own a second property, you will be taxed more right, on it. And if you own a third property, you will be taxed more. And then it gets to a point where if you own more properties, you will be taxed infinitely. So that property would be more expensive than the taxes will be more expensive than the property. These are kinds of progressive taxations that have been tested and, and are going to be tested in the following years uh, due to the fact that many governments agree that this, this is uh, you know, the dystopian future that we might face. Another thing would be to remove tax exemptions on capital gains on properties and all kinds of tricks that happen around that. For example, Canada um, is trying to also tax um, the property that is being sold uh, to foreign uh, citizens in a much higher rate than that that is uh, being sold to local citizens. And this is due to the fact that most of the, uh, the property rise uh, in Canada is deemed to have started with a tremendous outflux of capital from Asian countries, specifically China, but also Japan, uh, that had flooded the housing market, uh, mostly in Vancouver and then after in Toronto. So uh, Canada is thinking of, you know, putting, implementing some form of taxation to avoid uh, these prices to go up due to international investment. So I don't disagree with this direction. Uh, there needs to be a massive fiscal reform that addresses uh, how much uh, a rich population can hoard and not pay taxes on property. And that has to be decided from a global perspective. And this is where I would wish that, you know, uh, international monetary organizations such as the, as the World Bank will be trying to push to begin to penalize countries that are not uh, functioning or doing uh, fiscal uh, reforms in order to avoid uh, a mass uh, buyout of properties by just a very few companies. Another uh, important uh, restructuring that we all need to push for is to get the real estate lobbies outside of politics. I don't think there's a country right now or a city where the real estate lobby doesn't influence uh, any form of election. Uh, just here in New York City, uh, it is known that the real estate board is the biggest donor to the mayor. 
and therefore most of the decisions that are taken are going in pro um, the capital extraction or the profit extraction of uh, for real estate private real estate developers we're discussing here putting a very very strict limits on on sort of the access of lobby firms uh, to politicians and perhaps even uh, criminalization of such things. Another form to ameliorate this that has been discussed has been the fines uh, for warehousing. Uh, if somebody has a property that uh, d doesn't get occupied in, let's say, one or two years, then the owner of that property begins to get fines either from the municipality or from a specific district. And then there, these fines could uh, go into um, more beneficial um, areas uh, that the city is doing in the case of welfare, education or health, uh, parks, etc., a very controversial direction that has also been discussed is that to eliminate the very restrictive zoning laws that uh, a lot of uh, cities have. That's a zoning laws in terms of restricting height, uh, in, uh, density, and construction of historical areas, historical sites, uh, arguing that uh, those restrictive uh, zoning laws um, don't permit um, the construction of new dwellings and, uh, as a matter of fact, m create areas where the price of real estate uh, is deemed to continue uh, going up and only benefiting those that live in those areas. This, of course, has many controversial uh, situations because uh, for-profit developers uh, um, will be the ones taking advantage of uh, non-restrictive zoning laws. And so these would have to go hand-to-hand -hand with uh, different kinds of uh, developing scenarios which are out of the hands of private uh, developers that are just seeking to deem profits uh, from an area. Another direction that has been touted, uh, again, in many uh, countries around the world, is a coming back of affordable housing. Uh, in some places we call them public housing, other places we call them social housing, other places we call them affordable housing, but basically is housing that has its uh, price controlled and its access to it also controlled so that housing becomes less speculated upon. Uh, in some other scenarios, uh, this kind of housing also includes a lot of uh, tax subsidies, uh, but also income subsidies uh, according to the price brackets and the kind of population that would live in it. All of these ideas are being discussed in the, by politicians. Now, but how about uh, more radical ideas? How about uh, new property conceptions, new property models, new forms of ownership, new forms of dwelling, different forms of occupying space, takeovers, squattings, the homesteadings. I actually feel that uh, the future looks more promising when we begin to think about the many mobilizations that are happening at the moment from the radical front. Many organizations are currently being picked up by a, an idea that is called a community land trust, for example. You know, community land trust is a shared ownership. Uh, different uh, people own the land and different people own the housing. And there are committees that decide over who controls and who is, who is going to live there. And most importantly, it's a type of organization that does not permit uh, people to speculate on property which is at the heart of what I'm trying to say. I mean, if right now most of the property has been emphasizing its exchange value, these new radical mechanisms, such as a community land trust, will be mostly or continue to emphasize the use value of the property. That means that you don't get a house to speculate on, but you get a house because you want to live in it. And that's going to be the use until you die. To all my listeners, I encourage you to look into uh, community land trusts such as the Cooper Square Community Land Trust in New York City, which has always been seen as an exemplary case of uh, keeping affordable housing at the heart of a city where the housing is not affordable. But new forms of that are beginning to appear, and not only in the United States, but also in many places in Europe. And I certainly have been in discussions with people in South America uh, for the proposition of forming uh, land trusts. Other incredible radical propositions follow uh, the idea of structuring uh, finance groups where the possibility of co-housing or co-living uh, is allowed, 
right, where you have a shared uh, living spaces, shared working spaces in which the burden of uh, the finance viability of a home gets shared among the different individuals where banks have to deal with collectives and cooperatives rather than one singular you know, entity where uh, people in itself also are self-built uh, their own environment, you know, homesteading uh, programs uh, around the world where uh, cities will be providing um, uh, benefits if you put sweat equity in the development of your own homes. So I can perfectly see a scenario where we see cities developing uh, where uh, population gets empowered um, by their municipality or by their country um, to build and rebuild, right, and assess uh, the sweat that they put into it into some form of equity for uh, social good. Another form that tends to be seen as more traditional, but in my view, it's incredibly radical, specifically on the context of today, would be to work on the development of contemporary forms of housing cooperatives. I perfectly see a future constructed of uh, limited equity cooperatives, right, where, again, people decide over what happens uh, in their own neighborhoods or in, in their own space, in their own land. And there's more agency given to them uh, rather than agency given to uh, the private developer, which decides over how they should live and what they should do. I tend to fantasize a lot about this. We don't need to accept a future where the international real estate agencies will be controlling and uh, getting hold of property just to store value and not care about who lives in them. My view of an urban future has to be full of these new inventive, radically rethought forms of dwelling, forms of associating, forms of financing property, forms of creating uh, solidarities for living. This is where the future should go. And I encourage all of you to work on that. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.